my role has kind of three parts. Uh, the Content Authenticity Initiative is something I was started by Adobe just about a year ago. It was announced at Adobe Max, which is uh, the big Creative Cloud conference that happens every year. Um, and in November 2019, Scott Belsky, Chief Product Officer, got up on stage and announced the initiative uh, in collaboration with partners, the New York Times and Twitter. Um, and since then, we've focused on, on three areas, which is where my team is, um, is working every day. Uh, first is on standards. So we're, we're very bullish on creating a standard for content attribution um, that is secure. And we'll get into the details of what that means. Um, we're, of course, rolling out these technologies in a very early form into the Adobe Creative Cloud product, starting with Photoshop. And I'll show you a little preview of what that looks like. Um, and thirdly, we're working with partners to create prototypes um, across the ecosystem. So in Michael's presentation, we heard about all the various players from creators to publishers um, to rights agents and others. And we're trying to build a technology that is accessible to all of them. Um, so. OK, uh, here's what I'll cover today. And I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. There were some good questions about securing metadata uh, already during the Google presentation. So I hope to be able to address some of those and many others that you may have. Um, we'll talk about what the Content Authenticity Initiative is. Um, by the way, my role at Adobe is director of the Content Authenticity Initiative. I myself and many of my colleagues often say CIA instead of CAI. Um, so I am not, in fact, the director of the CIA, but I am often introduced that way. Um, we'll talk about what the, what the initiative is and what it hopes to achieve. Um, we'll talk in some depth about how it works. Um, we'll talk about the technology that underlies it and kind of where we are with the specifications towards standards. And then I'll wrap up with kind of what we've done in about nine months with the initiative going on a year uh, and what's coming next and perhaps how some of you can be involved. So let's start with, you know, what is the CAI at its heart? Um, this quote was shared with me by one of my colleagues on the team uh, earlier today. Um, and it was written by Jonathan Swift nearly 300 years ago. Um, he said, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it, which I think is just a perfectly apt description of metadata and truth, depending on how you define it in the ecosystem in which we live and wake up every day. Um, there's a key piece here that's very relevant to what we do on the CAI. And that is that um, you know, there are many ways to detect, flag, and address inauthentic content on the web. Uh, one of them, of course, is detection, um, which we'll get into a little bit. Um, but the problem is that by the time something can be detected or taken down or flagged, the damage has largely been done. Um, and you know, in uh, this Swiftism, falsehood flies, meaning that you know, once someone shares something on Facebook because it fits their worldview or by, because they believe it to be true, or they believe it to be satirical when it wasn't intended that way, uh, or in the more malicious cases, someone is actually sharing disinformation uh, willingly to accomplish something. Um, by the time something is shared, uh, it has a half-life uh, that exceeds the ability for us to take it down or print a redaction or, or those kinds of things. So we're really in a new world where increasingly it's more important to prove what is true at inception when something is created or published or shared um, than it is to detect what is false. Both are key pillars of what we think about, but we've decided to focus on the former. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, this is a quote from a white paper that we published in August. Um, and it's about the mission of the CAI to sort of frame the discussion today. So I'm just gonna read this. The mission of the CAI is to develop the industry standard for verifiable content attribution. <clears throat> Excuse me by augmenting subjective judgments about authenticity with objective facts about how a piece of content came to be, the CAI aims to help content consumers make more informed decisions about what to trust. Um, so at its essence, uh, and I like that Michael started earlier today with a discussion of truth. Um, and in my first uh, statement on the first slide, I kind of avoided a definition of truth. Um, just to be very clear, the CAI attribution framework does not intend to uh, cement the underlying truth of what is depicted in an image or a video. Um, it does go a long way towards using cryptography to verify data that's been applied, to know who applied it, why they applied it, um, and ultimately how a piece of content came to be. We, we sometimes refer to that as provenance. Um, and this is what we think is, is required in, in the current news industry and the current state of affairs. Um, but it's also extremely accretive to content creators. 
who want to submit things like copyright and other sort of human assertions as, as we call them. Um, this, hopefully there's a, a video you can see playing. I don't know how the frame rate is on Zoom, um, but this is showing a, a screenshot from Adobe After Effects. Um, we refer to Adobe products often as magical, you know, going back to Content Aware Phil back, I think in 2012. This is an example of something more recent um, from After Effects where uh, items in this image and eventually the entire, uh, uh, both humans have been removed from the photo. And this is done in real time. So while these frames are rendering in an editing tool, uh, we're able to remove things uh, as the frames fly by at 60 frames per second. Um, and that goes to another sort of core pillar of what we believe on the, on the CAI. That is that, uh, you know, the democratization of tools that do amazing things, often and increasingly powered by AI, um, is something that is increasing uh, exponentially and nearly daily. So this is an example of a tool that can be used for extraordinary creative purposes, um, but can also be used for deleterious purposes. Um, and our goal is to provide transparency around uh, what was done, who did it, and in some cases to conclude why something might have been done. Um, in, you know, decades ago, there were only two or three news sources. Uh, you would pick the news source and perhaps the talking head that, fixed, that fit your worldview. Um, and when you talked about shared view of facts, uh, you probably got your news from one of those three sources. Nowadays, everyone is a news source. Every one of your friends is a news source. Everything you follow on Twitter is potentially a news source. And each portrays a slightly different worldview, different motivations for sharing, um, and in some cases, different uh, realities of content that is produced. And we're trying to bring transparent, transparency to all that. Um, so how would I size up the, the current situation? There are really five um, key things that are happening simultaneously uh, that bring us to this place. Um, sometimes I get asked, why wasn't the content authenticity initiative started five years ago? We'd be in a much better place. Um, and this is an attempt to sort of explain why we are where we are and why we're moving quickly to address some of the needs. Um, number one, advances in technology. And again, this goes to what I just said about democratization of very powerful AI powered technologies that can be used for, for great creative purposes. Second, proliferation of content. Um, we call this uh, uh, content um, velocity at Adobe often, which is the amount of time it takes for something uh, creative finished to leave your phone or your device of choice or your tool of choice to uh, you know, massive publication viewing by millions of viewers on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, um, is moments where it used to be minutes or hours. Uh, content intended to deceive is a real thing. Now, it remains to be seen how this will impact international events, uh, notably the election that's about to um, happen in the United States. Uh, but I think we haven't seen the, the watershed of deep fakes and even cheap fakes that we expect, but we will. It's, it's very early days. And as these tools become more and more democratized, I think we'll see more deceptive content that is intended to be shared and disseminated for negative purposes. Um, and you know what's tying this all together? Lack of transparency. I think we have access to technologies that can be built into platforms uh, like the CAI that can provide the very transparency that uh, was not important to have five years ago, but is critically important to have now. So we think about three pillars of uh, solving the problem. The problem widely defined as how do you provide the transparency that I just talked about. Education is absolutely key. Um, this is not something that Adobe can do alone. In fact, none of these things are, are Adobe's uh, job to do alone. Education is, uh, goes beyond media literacy, which we often talk about, to a common understanding of the terms that need to be used to classify uh, attack vectors and deep fakes and cheap fakes and the technologies used to build them. We think it's important for consumers of all kinds and all locations and all cultures to have a certain conversancy with these terms and understand what they mean. Uh, the second is detection. I talked about that a little bit earlier. You know, the ability to, to detect uh, what has been faked um, is uh, an arms race. And it's an arms race in a good way until the arms race is no longer relevant. And what I mean by that is the folks trying to proliferate inauthentic content are always gonna be one step ahead of those trying to detect it. And the reason is that uh, in many cases, the detection algorithms and techniques are shared. There may be um, a publicly available data set or training set that's used that hackers and folks trying to peddle negative content will have access to just like all the good intentioned uh, open source folks that will use it. Um, so we think this is important to pursue. Adobe has chosen not to focus there and to let other folks uh, focus on this. Facebook notably um, 
was involved in the deep fake detection challenge earlier this year. I'll talk about that in a second. And the place we've decided to focus is on attribution or provenance. Those are terms that we use interchangeably. And that again is cryptographically secure metadata applied at the source or at the time that something is edited or modified so we can capture the journey or the provenance of an image, a video, uh, or some other content from beginning to what a consumer might see. Um, just a quick note on the detection side and the, the Facebook deepfake detection challenge. Um, state of the art, which uses extremely sophisticated AI uh, to detect things uh, like heartbeats and blood circulation in images, videos, um, mannerisms, arm movements, I could go on and on. Um, this stuff is extremely sophisticated and the state of the art winning entry in the deep fake detection challenge that Facebook ran with the partnership on AI um, came up, I think, to uh, ultimately a 65% hit rate. Um, now that's impressive, right? Hundreds of thousands of fake videos mixed in with real ones. 65% um, is quite an achievement. However, when you consider this in the scope of the amount of things that are shared on Facebook every day in the billions, 65% um, actually is not much better than a coin toss. Uh, and we think that might get better than worse, but sort of fluctuate based on the, the arms race we, we talked about earlier. So what is attribution? Where are we focused? Attribution is the who, the what, and the how. Who could be the identity of a photographer. It could be the identity of an organization, like a, a news agency. Um, the what is what has happened to this image, what was done. And the how is what was used, what tools were used, how was this thing actually made? Um, that may be critically important, for example, in photojournalism, um, which we talked a lot about today in the context of IPTC. Um, but it might be equally important for a creator, uh, a Photoshop artist creating beautiful paintings in Photoshop or Illustrator, uh, where they're interested in actual authorship attribution or copyright. And we think the same sets of technologies can be used to accomplish both. Um, our goal, ultimately, uh, I read the mission earlier, is to set the industry standard for digital content attribution. Uh, and underlying this is that the content attribution is secure. So we'll, we'll get to this a little bit later, but we're not looking to reinvent existing standards, um, IPTC being one of those that we consider very carefully. Uh, we're instead looking to underscore existing standards and put things together in a novel way so there is a level of cryptographic verifiability around metadata for, for these assets. Um, and why are we doing this now? So, you know, one of the great um, uh, impetuses for doing this at Adobe was something that happened uh, last year. It seems like eons ago. I'm sure many of you have seen the so-called cheap fake of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Um, this, use, this uses no AI whatsoever. Uh, this is a very simple alteration where certain frames of a news video were slowed down. Uh, to make Ms. Pelosi appear intoxicated or handicapped in some way. Um, and this was shared widely. Again, tremendous damage was done in terms of uh, people's view of her, this particular uh, news conference, uh, before it could be taken down or before it was noted to have been faked. Uh, and it was not very sophisticated at all. Um, so at Adobe, we felt like this is the time to begin pursuing um, a solution to this. And, you know, we're going to go with what we know. We understand copyright. We understand the tools that are used. If I'm not mistaken, an Adobe tool was quite certainly used in making this cheap fake. Photoshop is uh, sometimes used synonymously with fakery and images. Um, and that it would be prudent for Adobe to spin up an effort in collaboration with many other companies, uh, interest groups, NGOs, human rights defenders, uh, to begin to conceive of a standard way to address this kind of misinformation by simply providing transparency to consumers and specifically not to judge this for fake, real, or otherwise, but to give consumers the data they need to make up their own minds. I'm going to jump into how it works. I usually, um, I'm an engineer by trade, so I usually jump right into the metadata details and cryptography. Uh, we'll get to all that, but I think it might be better to sort of look at this from a high level from a user experience point of view. Uh, because if people don't use the tools, don't understand how they work, perhaps most importantly, understand the terminology and the iconography that we will um, use and, and hope for to achieve ubiquity with, then it, it's not really meaningful at all. So this is the view of uh, Photoshop. This is uh, a very early preview of what we will have in beta in Photoshop later this year. Um, it shows a couple of things. Uh, one, it shows that the tool is opt-in. This is a, 
effectively a mandate uh, that the standard will put forth that says nobody can be required to reveal their identity, um, the provenance information about what tools were used or how something was made, which might uh, be impactful and not desirable for a creative artist, by the way, but might be desirable for a photojournalist. Um, and all of the data you include or don't include is up to you as the creator user. Same would go for an editor. Um, in this case, we can see the beginnings of what we call a content authenticity claim. That's the cryptographic bit of data that gets signed and sealed into existence via the CAI metadata system. Um, we can see who produced this, what tool was used in this case, because we've opted into all the options. Uh, and we can see that Adobe is going to sign this and we'll, we'll get into a little more depth on what that means. Um, here's that image in the next uh, stage. And so hopefully a, a lighthearted look at snowy pyramids. Um, I believe this was actually a satirical view of pyramids with snow that was uh, largely taken to be reality, uh, sort of, you know, anything is believable in this time of global warming. This is not true. Um, and I showed you the source image a moment ago. And here, notably, you can see that the source image, perhaps a, a stock image from Adobe stock was used uh, and effects were applied to come up with this, um, including, you can see colors and adjustments, styles and effects. If AI tools had been used, you'd see that as well. So again, a summary to potentially give a consumer a good idea of what they're looking at, how it came to be. Here's a view of that same image on Behance, which is Adobe's social media creation and sharing platform. Same information. Uh, digested in a, a sort of summary that's easy to look at, understand. And then if one were to click on view all data, uh, this is a site that we will be bringing to life in a few months called verify.contentauthenticity.org, where, you know, a more forensically oriented user could see all of the details about an image, what comprises it, uh, what ingredients were used, what tools were used, etc. And in fact, if multiple image, images brought in to create this composite were used, you'd be able to see the provenance data for each of them, sort of a creative graph, if you will. So I'm gonna jump now to talk a little bit about how all of this works. Um, hopefully the, the user experience I shared gives you a little bit of a grounding in what we hope to achieve. Uh, that of course was in the Adobe ecosystem, but you can imagine seeing similar user experiences on the New York Times, Twitter, uh, many other publishers, tools, et cetera. Um, I'm going to go through some of the design goals from a technology point of view um, and then uh, dive into a, a few of, of these I think are particularly relevant for this audience. Um, number one, we intend to create only the minimum required novel technology. That means we will use existing standards wherever, wherever we can. Uh, and in some cases, uh, doing a little bit more work to use existing standards and not invent something new. That goes for the cryptography, the way we store metadata in files, the way we access metadata that's in the cloud. Um, we won't require cloud storage, although you can imagine um, there are many advantages to having data stored in the cloud. Uh, for example, if thumbnails are captured, as I showed in the example in the Adobe ecosystem, they could be quite large. If thumbnails are intended or captured versions of images are required to do A-B forensic comparisons, uh, it would in many cases be um, prudent to store those in the cloud rather than stick them into the, the file itself and cause file bloat. Allow flexibility in nature of information stored. Um, this means that there will be a basic namespace for key CAI assertions. Assertions are the, the facts that we insert and wrap into CAI claims, but this has to be extensible. So if a camera manufacturer wishes to add their own assertions, uh, if we embrace more of uh, the universe of IPTC assertions, potentially, we'd want this to be extensible, namespaced, and well understood by any tool uh, looking at reading CAI metadata. Um, claims and assertions, and we'll get to the definition of these shortly, um, they must be able to be consistently hashed. So hashing is the mechanism by which we create fingerprints. Um, and in some cases, uh, to have a robust fingerprint, we look at various parts of files and metadata, as well as the bits of the image or the video or what have you, so that they can be consistently hashed, verified, signatures verified, et cetera. Um, I'll skip over a couple of these uh, that are a little bit in the weeds. Um, maintain a trail of claims across multiple tools from creation through modification, publication, distribution. In the ideal world, we would achieve with the CAI a certain amount of ubiquity so that wherever you publish, share, etc., metadata would not be stripped. Um, I know this was a hot button item that's been talked about already. Uh, not only would it not be stripped, but the, the key bits of CAI metadata would be carried through across all platforms. However, we realize that's not realistic um, thanks to WordPress and things like it. Uh, not to knock on WordPress, many platforms uh, strip metadata. 
in the interest of keeping files small, perhaps, uh, but that there would be a way to recover cloud-based provenance data and reattach it or reassociate it with files. And that's something we're, we're working on that we intend to make part of the standard as well. And finally, support standard asset formats. Um, I often say, you know, standard asset formats are the ones we know about now, but there are new ones coming along. We intend to support AR, VR, most importantly, streaming uh, of audio continuous file formats uh, and things like that. But we also acknowledge that there are file formats to come in the future that we have not yet imagined. Um, and we want the system to be extensible enough and uh, in many ways simple enough that they can be adopted as well. Uh, here are some of the core technologies we use. Um, I won't go through all of these, but uh, I will call out a specific one coming from the, the JPEG group. Um, I understand from sitting in on some of the JPEG meetings, this is pronounced Joomf, although on the team we say Jumbuf, which is I think a little bit easier for Americans to say. Um, this is a box format for those of you who understand uh, a little bit about file formats that enables us to associate um, data signatures and a URI scheme that lets us find assertions and claims in files or in the cloud. And that's very important because you could end up uh, in a perfectly reasonable CAI situation with some assertions and details in the file and still others in the cloud. For example, in the case where you create a composite of an Adobe stock image, um, a Getty image, and something that you created on your own, perhaps a photo from your phone, you might have various implementations of the CAI with their metadata stored either in the cloud or in the file. Uh, and the CAI system allows us to traverse all of those to give the end user a very clear um, ordered set of assertions and facts about the, about the image. Uh, CAI metadata is just metadata. Uh, just like the IPTC knows well, it uh, happens to be cryptographically verifiable. That means that it's hashed and signed, but at the end of the day, this is binary or plain text information that is stored in a file or in the cloud. Um, it comprises facts regarding asset creation, authorship, edit actions, um, again, anything that happened to an image from an inception, perhaps a controlled capture device, a camera, a phone, all the way up to what a consumer might be seeing along the way. And there are affordances as well for the reality before we achieve ubiquity with the CAI, that something may fall off the golden path, as we call it, meaning it may be edited in a tool that doesn't yet fully support CAI data. Um, minimally, those tools would carry the CAI data along, but even if they don't, uh, we, have, um, we have approaches that will restore the data and make it clear what has happened to a consumer. Um, assertions and claims, this is sort of the bedrock of, of what we talk about. Um, as I mentioned, we published a white paper in August, and if anyone's interested in getting a little bit more detail on how this works, what these things are, um, our guiding principles, and perhaps most importantly, the use cases we imagine for CII data, I'd urge you to uh, download the white paper by visiting contentauthenticity.org. Assertions essentially are distinct facts uh, embodied in metadata about an image in this case. Um, they could be the identity of the creator, they could be uh, related to the tools that were used, specific categorizations of tools like AI tools, et cetera. Um, and really anything related to um, things that computers might insert into an image. So if you are authenticated to Adobe at the time you're using Photoshop, we could capture your identity if you opt into capturing that. But it can also um, cover things that are entered by humans. So copyright being an interesting one. Things like claim review, which is a burgeoning early standard for fact checkers. Um, these are things where the signing authority, such as the New York Times or another publication, could vouch for the person entering this human readable data, human entered data. Um, and the trust model would represent a certain uh, imbuing of trust by the signing authority, even though this was entered by a human, not a computer. Not that computers are particularly more trustworthy than humans, but there is a distinction we make between machine-created assertions and human-created assertions. And claims uh, simply wrap these things into cryptographically verifiable units. Uh, this is a little bit more about uh, assertions. Uh, they're basically JSON-based data structures. They are packed into uh, a claim based on what a user has done and, and when they create the claim could be based on uh, an export-based workflow, which we're focused on with Photoshop right now. Um, and they're stored in what we call an assertion store, which again could be part of the file or, or addressable via the cloud. Just to make this more concrete, um, here's a list of some defined assertions. This is by no means exhaustive. 
Um, but you can scan this list and see the kinds of things we have in mind in addition to tools that we use, uh, location, broad and precise, detailed camera information. Again, not trying to reinvent EXIF, but creating a, a narrow set of assertions that uh, can be either pulled from EXIF or created by a camera at the same time EXIF information is imprinted. Copyright uh, ingredients, which would be a list of other assets used to, to compose the current one you're looking at. Um, Etc. It's worth noting that we do support a number of IPTC fields via standard XMP, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, finally, you know, what is the claim uh, in a little more detail? The, the claim attaches the metadata we talked about earlier to the asset itself, and that's done by hashing and signing bits of the asset. So that could be other types of metadata like XMP very specifically. Uh, a standard Adobe came up with that's now fairly ubiquitous across all file types. Uh, it could represent certain keyframes in a video, but effectively um, a repeatable hashing algorithm that represents with good robustness uh, a, a fingerprint for the asset, if you will. And claims and assertions via claims are attached to that fingerprint, not the asset itself. So one thing I often get asked is, oh, okay, is Adobe or our CAI partners building a massive clearinghouse um, of images and videos? The answer is uh, absolutely not. What we intend to do is connect these fingerprints in files or in various clouds, one of which uh, is Adobe's, uh, to the verifiable metadata that is represented by claims and assertions. Um, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm gonna sort of end this technical session with a. Uh, quick look at what a claim actually looks like in a file. Um, so this is an example of the storage, uh, just like, let, let's say this is a JPEG. This uses that box format so that there are boxes that represent the assertion store, a single claim represented in red there, and then a claim signature represented in orange. So a reader of this file or uh, somebody with a file and a link to a cloud-based claim would be able to interrogate this data structure and come up with all of the data that was shared uh, and saved for its provenance. In this case, the location, the detailed actions that were taken to edit it and produce it, the identity of the photographer, for example, and a thumbnail representing what this image uh, looked like at the time the claim was created. With multiple thumbnails or representations, um, you can easily imagine a user interface, which we're experimenting with, that would show you not only the detailed provenance data for each step of the journey via claims, but a side-by-side -side comparison, a timeline uh, that would show you what this looked like at camera capture time, all the way up to what something looks like shared. And again, in the spirit of transparency, the consumer would be able to decide whether too many things were changed for this to be believable, or if a person was inserted, or if a synthetic sky was uh, substituted, et cetera. And here's um, a way to consider putting this all together. So step-by-step, the CAI works as follows. In step one, we create an original asset, again, sticking with the camera photojournalist uh, use case. This would be happening on a camera. Step two, we create all of the assertions about the camera. It could be location, uh, identity of the person using the camera, uh, all of those things we've already talked about. In step three, we'd calculate a set of hashes that represent the unique fingerprint for this asset as it's been captured. Um, step four, we would formulate, it, that, formulate that into a JSON structure. Uh, then we would sign that. Um, currently, this is the part of the process that requires that the device or the software be online. But there are partners of ours implementing this as an offline fashion using one-time signing keys um, so that this can be done fully offline, especially in, in a device situation or low bandwidth situation. Um, finally, the signature is calculated. This is the thing that uh, makes the claim and its assertion cryptogra cryptographically verifiable. Uh, and all of this, in this case, is stored in the image, as I showed you in the previous uh, depiction. Is IPTC supported? Yes, uh, to some degree. Uh, we look forward to working with IPTC folks to bring broader support for IPTC, given its uh, importance and criticality to the news industry. Um, and this is a very straightforward um, exercise as we move forward creating new types of assertions and pointing to existing assertions that can be uh, derived from XMP data. I wanna talk a little bit about where we are now. So um, the Content Authenticity Initiative has been in place for going on a year, again, announced last November at Adobe Max. Um, we've been focused on the three areas, standard specifications, uh, starting with our white paper, 
partner prototypes. These are actually, you know, nothing speaks louder to me and many of our partners and I think the world than working prototypes and working code. So we're hard at work uh, with um, hardware partners, software partners, platform partners, including Twitter, New York Times, Microsoft, and many others, um, to build these things into um, sort of cross-company implementations that demonstrate interoperability across implementations. Uh, and last, of course, the creative cloud. Adobe has massive reach to creators from photographers to artists of all kinds. And we intend to do extensive testing with these ideas, um, especially when it comes to user experience through our reach with the creative cloud tools. Very quickly, here's a, a quick list of just a few of the, the companies that we're working with. Um, notably Witness, which is a human rights defense organization, NGO, that really focuses on accessibility, um, ensuring anon anon anonymity, excuse me, um, of photographers in the field, uh, capturing conflict situations. Uh, partnership on AI we're engaged with um, recently, uh, and they're helping us do the proper user experience studies and terminology studies to, again, make sure that this is accessible and understandable to consumers all over the world. Um, finally, what's next? So we've got a number of upcoming milestones, among them a Photoshop beta uh, in the Adobe toolkit that will be out later this year. Uh, to a closed set of beta users and then rolled out, I think probably early next year uh, as a general, generally available first implementation in Photoshop. Many partner prototypes um, that will be announced. We have an event coming up probably in, in December, um, which I'll tease now. I urge you to keep an eye on the CAI. Please sign up for our mailing list. We have a very exciting announcement coming up in December. Um, and always focused on expanding the set of collaborators that we work with uh, across all sorts of diverse points of view. Lastly, most importantly for the future of the CAI, uh, we have developed a clear charter uh, for a consortium. So this started out as an Adobe-led effort with partners signing up with Adobe to be part of it. We've now moved past that stage as of our white paper published in August. Uh, and there are founding activities underway to create a true consortium with a steering committee and a membership model to uh, quickly get to work creating the technical specs that will uh, pave the way towards standardization. This will have an open membership model. Uh, we envision four to six working groups uh, to start and a model for spinning up additional working groups as required. Um, lastly, you know, I'd urge uh, call to action for all of you to consider joining us in this endeavor. Um, IPTC is part and parcel to transparency and metadata. We think we're bringing a level of transparency and verifiability that uh, IPTC data can uh, benefit from and consumers and news professionals can certainly benefit from. Keep an eye on upcoming announcements. Again, visit us at contentauthenticity.org. Um, we regard the IPTC as a key stakeholder and I'll continue talking to Brendan and Michael about how best to get the organization involved. But I would urge you all to reach out um, consider joining the initiative. And if you would like to reach me, this is how to do it. Um, we also have a Twitter handle, Content Auth, where we uh, put up the latest and greatest in terms of updates. We're trying to be very transparent in the spirit of transparency that we all uh, wish to engender in our announcements and activities. But please reach out if you would like to be involved. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your time. And I guess we have a few minutes for Q&A. That's great. Thanks very much, Andy. That was really informative. So uh, even uh, like I've read the white paper, but you gave more information there than what I've seen in some parts of the white paper. So it was really great to see all of that detail. Uh, so we can go through some of the questions that have been asked in the panel. And please, uh, the audience, can you ask some more uh, questions so we can pass them on to Andy? Uh, so. Uh, David asked uh, that you said you already support some IPTC fields via standard XMP. Uh, could you note which fields you support? Is it uh, the standard create a copyright credit or is it something else? It is those. I had a feeling someone was going to ask me this. I just added mm -hmm. that slide earlier today. I don't have a comprehensive list, but can certainly come up with one. I think if you look at the XMP standard, there are IPTC fields. I think the ones that you just mentioned, Brendan, that are supported along with a few others. Um, but again, it's very straightforward to namespace additional keys, pull them from IPTC that uh, devices and software might add and imbue them with this verifiability that the CAI represents. So, so we'll, we'll be working with you to do more of that. That sounds great. Yeah, we'd definitely be happy to 
work together with you on that. Maybe we can even make it so that all of the RTC fields can be supported just because there's some standard wrapper that we can put on top of everything, maybe. Absolutely, yes. Great. Uh, so Daniel asked a question which I think you've mostly answered. Will CAI be distributed in nature or centralized? So I think you've made it. It's a great, clear. It's a great question. Yeah, this is the essential blockchain question. So um, we talk about this a little bit in the white paper, but um, I would be lying if I said we have it completely figured out. So uh, a key pillar of what we're doing is the trust model. Um, there are many things coming out of, uh, for example, the decentralized ID group from W3C that we think will pave the way for truly, for full decentralization of claim storage, identity, et cetera. Um, they're not quite ready for prime time, in my estimation, in the same way that Bitcoin wallets are still notoriously difficult to use. Um, so we're starting with, we're taking a pragmatic eye towards starting with something like a trust list, you know, uh, which Adobe in particular has decades of experience managing, and that is that signing authority, authorities will be part of a trust list. Um, they're given the ability to sign claims on behalf of their organizations, and that is managed centrally. Uh, but that's just the beginning. The, the model that we talk about in the white paper and that we'll talk more about in the standards will embrace decentralized, decentralization. So, for example, uh, you might have a consortium of news organizations which wishes to sign things and store them on a blockchain. The protocols dictated by the CAI do nothing to preclude that. In fact, we would encourage it. Um, but we're not dictating a single trust model, either centralized or decentralized. So uh, another way of saying it is that you're not requiring that people use a blockchain either to turn that around. That is correct. Great. So uh, just a note for myself, the trust list idea you just talked about, is that kind of equivalent to HTTPS certificates, the same sort of idea? Very similar. And in fact, yeah. HTTPS is my favorite uh, analog um, in the same way that folks used to put random personally identifiable data, identifiable data and credit card information into browsers um, without a lock, they have come to understand what the lock icon means. And that, that represents the ubiquity I talked about uh, earlier. Um, but they don't need to understand the actual trust list or the certificate chain or what a certificate authority is. But that is, uh, that is exactly what I do with a, with a trust list, Brendan. Great. Uh... Akira asks, is CAI aiming at being standardized as de facto or de jure, de jure uh, through something like ISO or IEC? Uh, absolutely. So we're effectively doing both. So on the de facto standard side, um, we're looking to partner with as many folks in the ecosystem, again, from hardware manufacturers to mobile OSs to browsers, all the way through to publishers and social media, so that we can begin to achieve a certain amount of um, traction before standards are actually adopted by a standards organization. But we have uh, very tight connections to both ISO and W3C. When the time is right and we have the specifications to a level of maturity, uh, we'll choose the right standards organization to partner with. Great, thanks very much. Uh, Stefan has asked, uh, and you say claims wrap the sessions into verifiable units. So the question is, what is a verifiable unit and who and what and how carries out this verification? <laughs> if it's verifiable, then who does the verifying? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and I could talk about it for hours, which we don't have. So the brief answer is, if you think of this as sort of uh, a system, not unlike DNS, when it comes to looking up names, resolving names into IP addresses, um, each verifiable unit, each claim, and its composite assertions um, have some information about where to fetch the data to verify them. So that means uh, this is where we might find a certificate, a uh, public key to check the signature that was used to sign this thing into existence. It might also tell us where to locate the details of the assertions um, that a manufacturer uh, or software vendor might have. So effectively, the standard is a, is a way to find uh, and direct the software looking to verify the claim uh, as to where to get it and how to verify it. And again, this is a, a very standard cryptographic signature verification uh, based on the hashes I described earlier. So that does not need to be centralized in the simplest and simplest and maybe earliest implementation. It will be centralized via this trust list. Uh, but again, certificates can be looked up. Uh, claims can be located on whatever server or file location that the creator wishes to put them. But I guess if someone says their name is Mickey Mouse, you're not verifying that their real name is Mickey Mouse. 
you're just verifying that that information was placed into the file at that time. That's correct. And there are levels of verifiability of um, authorship or identity. Obviously, if you are a Photoshop user who's paying for a Creative Cloud account, um, there might be an extra level of trustworthiness in your name being associated with the account. Um, if this is a Twitter account and Twitter is making assertions and I can be Barack Obama if I choose to be, there would be less trustworthiness. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, these are some of the um, details that we have yet to figure out. How do you portray the level of trustworthiness without making judgment calls in the user interface that consumers will ultimately experience? Um, and that is an unsolved problem. So in many ways here, the technical implementation is the easy part. Um, the sort of um, cultural, sociological implications of communicating that is a much more difficult problem. And we're working on it. May, may I jump in at this point? Uh, what are your intentions or plans, how this should be implemented in parallel, uh, or you actually then used in parallel with the existing metadata? Uh, because I think uh, people will say, okay, do I have now to switch all the metadata that? And what if I use uh, the, the, the now the secure metadata and my customs are not able to read that and to uh, verify that? So should so to, then the to, old one and the new ones be in parallel? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of questions in there, Michael. Also one that we get asked a lot. Um, as much as possible, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. So for example, I talked about XMP and the potential that some IPTC data stored in XMP would be considered. And the way that's done is that um, the XMP block in an image, for example, uh, will be hashed as part of the fingerprint of the image, meaning that if the XMP data is present, it will be part of the indelible fingerprint representing that image. So that doesn't require that the reader or the writer of additional metadata um, have used CI methodology to put it there. And in fact, in the case of a large image archive, perhaps um, Getty, uh, which we heard about earlier, um, an, an organization like Getty could retroactively make their um, metadata verifiable simply by being Getty and signing those assertions and claims as Getty meaning this did not come from a CAI compliant device because they did not exist 10 years ago or five years ago or five months ago. But uh, if you trust that we are Getty or you know, we are PictureMax, um, you can trust that we have verified this data and we are cryptographically signing it now. Great, so that answers another question that John Berlin uh, asked about, is this only applicable to new content or legacy content? So I think you've just answered that, thank you. Uh, Stefan had another question. How long would this process take for in a real-time production workflow? Say a news agency that's doing hundreds or thousands of images a day, does it add much time to their production workflow to enable these features? The answer, my favorite answer to a question like this is it depends. It depends on the implementation. If your news desk has, um, you know, locally proximate servers uh, or software that does this um, in process, then you know we're talking on the order of milliseconds. If there's a server round trip to a signing authority required, you know we could be talking about uh, multiple seconds or you know more milliseconds than just a few. So I think it depends on the specific implementation. Um, some of our early partners who will join us in the consortium are working on the scalability concern, especially when it comes to verification. Perhaps the most expensive part of the process, where um, you know these are right once view millions of times potentially. So in cases where the viewing requires verification and the verification is not cached, uh, we have to be very careful about performance. Um, and that is something we're focused on right now. But in terms of the publishing process, we would talk about uh, adding on the order of milliseconds to the, to the process for each image. Great, thanks. Uh, Alan had an interesting question. Uh, and you talked about the use of human-based assertions from authorities such as the New York Times. Is the intention there to be able to support vouched for authenticity for sources such as anonymous journalists who may live in oppressive regimes or corporate whistleblowers? Is that one of the goals of the witness agency support? So the question of redacting fields and maybe saying, yes, this isn't the metadata that the original photographer included, but we're the New York Times, we vouch for it. So we've added a new set of metadata. Is that part of the use cases? This is the easiest question of all. I'm just going to say yes, uh, Brandon, <laughs> you put it aptly and succinctly, and that is exactly the reason for uh, redaction, which I did not cover in my talk, but is um, explored in the white paper. And that is exactly that. If identity is accidentally captured 
or needs to be removed or thumbnails where you have spaces that needed to be blurred, but you have a thumbnail where they are not blurred, you know, to prevent the kind of recovery of sensitive information, be it PII or location data, there is support for redaction. And I like the word vouch. I use it very much myself. The idea is that um, an organization that you trust uh, can vouch for the redaction or the claim or any CI metadata and thereby um, empower the publisher or the individual to remove data that would otherwise be necessary, such as identity. And vouching and thereby imbuing trust via a, a voucher claim is exactly our intent. Great. So uh, we have reached the top of the hour. So uh, we've run out of time for the event. So, uh, well, we've completed everything in the allotted time. I think that's the best way to say it. Uh, thanks to Andy and to everyone for keeping to the times that we'd um, set. And thanks to everyone for their great questions. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, we would love to stay in touch with everyone. Uh, so if you're not an IPTC member, we do have a public IPTC photo metadata discussion list, uh, groups.io slash IPTC dash photo metadata. I'll be sending the links out afterwards to everyone who's signed up. Uh, we've just started a newsletter for the public called Friends of IPTC, uh, which you can see from the uh, About IPTC menu item on IPTC.org. So please sign up for that and we'll let you know when we have other events for the public, such as this one. Uh, if you're from an organization that would benefit, then please consider joining IPTC. We'd love to have more members and you can see the sort of work that we do. So we definitely welcome uh, input from more organizations and more individuals and uh, helping us to drive industry standards forward. So uh, thanks again to Andy, to Michael, to Francois, to Matthew and to Marcin for all of their contributions today. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, got a lot out of the discussions. So hopefully everyone else did as well. So uh, thanks again to everyone. And uh, the recordings of Michael's session and Andy's session will be made available hopefully next week. And, uh, and we'll publish the uh, slide decks of uh, most of the presentations as well. Unfortunately, we can't for the Google ones, but for everyone else, uh, we can. So thanks again to everyone. And uh, please stay in touch. And maybe we'll do one of these virtual events again. So uh, hopefully, we'll get to see you at another event in the future. Thanks again all. Bye-bye.